Hi everyone, this is Jonathan Berry again. Thank you for joining this webinar on Oracle EPM Log Management. Uh, this webinar is part of our 21 Minutes with Excel to series. And given the limited amount of time we have, we may not be able to answer questions during the presentation, but we will answer all questions if you post them to the uh, GoToMeeting window uh, following the presentation. And I'll mention this again at the end, but if you'd like a copy of the recorded presentation, just shoot a note to Ed DeLisi, whose contact information is on this uh, head slide and will be on the slide at the end. Okay. So again, we're going to be talking about best practices for managing Oracle EPM log files. And as part of the presentation, we'll give a little bit of background on Excelitis. Then we'll get into some kind of basic constructs around Oracle EPM log management. We'll talk about the goals of what we want to accomplish with best practices. We'll discuss a few of the tools that are available. We'll get into some of the challenges around developing methodology. And then ultimately we'll talk about a sample approach. And finally we'll do a little bit of demo of how we handle this uh, in Excelitis. So for a little bit of background for, for those who don't know about us, uh, again, this is Jonathan Berry, founder and CEO of Exceltis. I was a long time uh, Hyperion person. I was actually one of the original engineers on the HFM uh, team and went on to lead the team until 2008 before spinning off this company. Also joining us is Ed DeLisi, partner at Exceltis and VP of Sales and Marketing, who led North American sales at Upstream and also was at Finit for many years before joining Exceltis. And our development team is comprised of former Hyperion developers and technologists, so we're really uniquely <clears throat> qualified to be bringing the solution and the methodology to you. So the last slide on the company is just to know that Exceltis is a software company. Uh, we do not do, uh, we do not do uh, consulting other than installing our own product. And we are uh, all about the Oracle EPM suite, including S-based planning, HFM, uh, reports, FDM, and all the other products. So, talking about some basic truths about Oracle EPM log management, really log management in general. The first is, and I'm sure everyone's experienced this at one time or another, is that log files, if they're unmanaged, can cause performance issues and even downtime. So, I, I think everyone's experienced that where a log gets full or is locked or might cause uh, di disk, disk space issues. The other thing, not so much related to technically managing it, but the harder it is to get access to log information and the more cumbersome it is, the less likely that you are to do it. And I think that this is really important because if log information is readily accessible, the more value you're going to get out of it. So as part of the methodology we want to put in place, it's one thing to manage logs for performance reasons, but it's also to make that information more available so that you'll get more value out of the information that's in the logs. And really under the covers, one of the reasons why it may be hard to access the logs or it may be cumbersome is that there's a tremendous amount of information in the logs. And some of it is very useful and important, and some of it is really not. So being able to separate it and focus on what's important is going to be a key part of what we're talking about today. So. The goals that we want to accomplish with establishing methodology, whether it's done manually or through a tool like Excel, is really, there, there's a couple. The first is that we want to be able to access relevant data at all times. And by relevant, we mean uh, not every record, but what's important in the logs. And that changes over time. So certain information is going to be relevant for a certain amount of time. And then it loses its relevant at relevance as that data ages. Some data, however, will stay relevant for much longer periods of time, so we can talk about how we'll do that filtering and, and, and make this happen. The second one is we want to keep the log size from causing performance issues, so it's really about keeping production logs trimmed so that they don't affect the performance of the production system. And then lastly, and this really goes to the point I just mentioned is that keeping all the archive records in one place for simplified access and backup and what we'll talk about here is getting these into a database because the easier they are to access the more likely you are to get at them. So if we incorporate this as part of our process it'll actually solve solve many problems for us. So just a couple of tools and again with the time that we have I, I don't really have the time to go into a lot of details on these. You're probably all somewhat familiar with both RDA and uh, ODL, but these are both technologies 
uh, from Oracle. RDA is really more about log gathering and very quickly getting uh, log records into one place that they can be sent to support or for further analysis. Radio ODL is more of the technology that all the Oracle logs are moving to. So with 11.122, many but not all of the logs are in a particular format where they can be managed in the same in the same mechanism uh, using the same tools. Again, we'll get into a little more details about how this helps, um, but with the time that we have today, I don't have. Uh, we won't get into more detail about the specifics of these, but these are uh, very widely documented. Um, so you can you can Google for this and understand more about how these can help you. But really, let's talk about the challenges. So um, with Oracle EPM, there are many different pr uh, product log types, and each product has different logs, and any one product may have multiple different logs in different formats. And the formats, they might be in the database, they might be flat files, they might be some, some other structure like Windows logs. Um, and they're in different locations. Again, Oracle is making great strides to get them all into one location. But they are still uh, there are still many logs that are are located throughout the uh, installation system. And lastly, there's different types of logs. So there's error logs. There's logs that contain user activity. Some logs contain uh, information about data changes, which are really more system events. And logs have different levels of detail. So some are very superficial and high level, and then some are very detailed. And different logging levels can be enabled uh, based on different logs. The next thing is we could spend all day talking about Oracle logs, but in the end, non-Hyperion logs are extremely important in doing root cause analysis as well. So things like WebLogic logs, IS logs, uh, even Windows event logs may have relevant data depending on the types of issues we're trying to investigate. Some other challenges are, that especially with flat file, flat file logs, is that they may be locked. So we can archive records out of them, meaning we can read them and get the information to another source, but it's difficult to purge them, so we cannot thin them out. So as the log grows, the only way to really get rid of them is to roll the log, meaning make a copy of it and delete the log entirely. Um, so some products will keep a lock on them. So for example, SBase will keep the SBase log file locks. So you cannot go in and write a script to easily purge it. You'd actually have to use a, a calc script to um, to clean out the logs. You'd have to do it in conjunction with other with other technologies. Um, number four, ultimately there are, there's no one mechanism for managing logs. Again, this is something that we try to accomplish with the Exceltis tool set that you'll see. Uh, but out of the box, there are so many different log formats and locations and types and data that there is no one mechanism for managing uh, the log system. Uh, next is that some logs will auto roll over and auto purge. And what that means is, as a log grows, especially with ODL, you can uh, configure it so that once it reaches a certain size, it will make a copy of itself, and then the production log will um, be emptied. Okay? And in some cases, logs will auto-purge, meaning they will only keep so much data, um, and they will kick out the oldest data. So depending on how fast the log is growing, and if the log is set to auto-purge, you actually may lose critical events that you would want to uh, hang on to. And then the last two points is, even those tools that we discussed, RDA and ODL, they can help with the process, but they they are useful for some functionality, but they will not always get the data in, in, in a format that's going to be easy for you to analyze. So again, it's part about managing the logs and part about making the data accessible so you can get value out of it. So they help with one, um, not as much with the other. And then the other thing is, is that the log details change with every version of Oracle. So again, Oracle is going in the right direction by moving them to the same place with the same technology. Uh, but with every version, you're going to be managing them in slightly different ways. So with Exceltis, we recommend an approach, and this is something that we implement in our product through best practices. Uh, but conceptually, we recommend an approach that solves both the performance issue as well as the accessibility issue. And it starts with archiving the records to a database for easy retrieval. So if you have multiple log files in multiple formats and you need to uh, do root cause analysis on a particular issue, <clears throat> it's going to be much easier if all of your records are in one place as opposed to dispersed through multiple flat file logs. The second is that we want to implement a multi-stage archive and purge scheme. So like I said before, 
as data ages, as log data ages, we want to thin it out as it gets older and older so that in the beginning we want access to all of our records. But as it gets older, we need less and less access. But ultimately, there's still going to be some records which are very important for us to keep for a longer period of time. Um, but more and more, we can, we can thin those logs out. So we can implement a multi-stage archive and purge scheme where each stage will archive certain records. So it will move from production logs to the archive. And it will purge another set of records, meaning just get rid of them. Because once they're a certain age, these type of records are of no, uh, no more value to us. Third is we want to be able to proactively kick off the archive and purge job. So these are something that could uh, run on a nightly basis or a weekly basis. And what it's going to do is always look for records that have aged past a certain threshold and then kick in the archive and purge jobs. And then even if we're proactively archiving and purging, it may be important to actually monitor the log sizes so that if we determine that there is a sudden increase in records that we can trigger the archive and purge job if they grow too large. Uh, one little anecdote is we have a client who, when you're on their system, uh, we have a KPI that tracks log size. And I thought that there was something wrong with our product because it looked like every two hours the KPI was going back to zero. And it turned out that they, in fact, had already implemented a purge process to purge the HFM system messages log every two hours because it had the ability to grow so quickly. So for some clients, Archiving and purging once a month may be adequate. For others, doing it every couple of hours may be more important. Okay. So then we have to think about what data to keep. And this is going to differ based on your internal processes. Uh, but certainly, as we said before, in logs, there's going to be errors, warnings, informational messages. There will be user activity. Uh, there might be data records. So some of the things that we often want to keep are key user activities. So knowing who has been doing what in the system. And this may or may not necessarily mean things like logging in, but certainly if someone is taking a major action, um, restructuring a database, doing things like loading metadata, these are activities that we may want to keep for a longer period of time because we may have a need to go back and reconcile these activities with what's going on in the system. There might also be key errors. So it might be that certain informational warning messages are not relevant after a certain amount of time. Um, but if we ever need to go back and analyze a situation that happened in the past, certain errors in the system may be reflection of other things that are happening in the system and may be predictive about problems that are happening in the future. So there may be key errors that we want to keep for some amount of time. Obviously, performance data is always useful depending on what type of log information you have. So things like perfmon data and things like that may be relevant. Um, aggregating it as it gets older. Is a, uh, is a technique we can use as well. But having some indication of what the performance of the system has been over time is certainly useful. Another one is records relating to when processes and services have, have, have started up or shut down. So being able to go back and understand uptime and when services have been available or not is useful. And these records generally don't take up a lot of space because there aren't uh, many of them. And they're useful to, to keep on hand for some amount of time. And obviously, any Sarbanes-Oxley related information, knowing who's done what in the system, where those actions relate to how numbers are presented, uh, whether it has to do with changing report definitions or loading uh, consolidation rules or metadata or security, any type of this, this information is useful to keep for a longer period of time. So I threw in a couple examples of things that are safe to eliminate. So if you've ever gone through an S-based log, you'll see many, many messages that look similar to the one that's here. You know, received client request, get application state. It's not, you know, as this gets older, this is not really going to give you any useful insight into what's going on in the system. So we can clean out a lot of the S-based records by getting rid of uh, most of these. Also on the HFM side, there's a very verbose XML sysinfo messages. Those sysinfo messages have some very important information in them, but a big part of the message is a lot of XML talking about file sizes and dates and locations that we don't need to keep. So there's a lot of stuff that we know that we can we can get rid of. Okay, so a sample approach to a, a scheme, if you will, um, and this is going to have three stages. One, the first stage is looking at data that's less than 30 days old, and for this sample, let's say that anything under 30 days, we want to keep all data. So we're going to have all user activity all errors, warnings, and information. All our logs really remain untouched. 
But as stage two, we're going to introduce an archive. So in our live logs, anything that's between 30 and 90 days old, the only thing we want is user activity. Let's get rid of errors and warnings, because after a month, we're likely not going to be going back and looking at errors and warnings in our live logs, but we may want to look at user activity. Um, but what we do is we take those errors and warnings and we move them to the archive, so they're still available, but they're not affecting the size or performance of our production logs. So this will take us out to a quarter. And then anything older than 90 days, all we're going to do is keep key user activity. So we'll filter some of the user activities, but anything that's uh, you know Sarbanes-Oxley related or other key activities that we want, we keep. But anything that's older than 90 days, in terms of errors or warnings, we're likely never going to go back and use and need to keep track of, so we can purge those out. So this is a conceptual view of, of how to look at it. <clears throat> this next window, it, we're going to visualize how the data flows into the system and gets filtered as it goes on. And for this example, we're actually looking at four stages. <clears throat> so a little bit different than the previous example. So and on the very top of the screen, we have in blue is our live logs and our black is our archive. And what you just saw creep in from the right side of the screen is activities and logs. And we're looking at everything. We're looking at errors in red, warnings in orange, the light blue are informational messages, and green are user activities. So as we said before, for 0 to 30 days, we're going to keep everything. We'll have access to all information. But at 30 days, we're going to kick in stage 1. And what stage 1 is going to do, it's first going to get rid of informational messages. So we don't need those in our logs. They're not doing us any good. They're just taking up space. So we're going to get rid of those. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take all errors and warnings, and we're going to send them to the archive. So beyond 30 days, the only thing that's in our live logs are user activity messages. And our archive, as you see, really contains nothing that's less than 30 days old. It starts at anything that's older than 30 days and moves beyond that. And right now it's just errors and warnings. So from 30 days to 60 days, this information will live in our logs. <clears throat> and then what we'll do is anything that's over two months old, we can say that we can get rid of warning messages because there's a lot of them. Um, we haven't done anything with it. We're going to get rid of them. The error messages we want to keep as a predictor of issues that we may see later on. But stage two is going to remove warning messages out of our archive. So now we have user activity in live logs, error messages in our archive, and that will live for 60 to 90 days. Now, 90 days, we're at three months, we're at a quarter. Um, if we haven't done anything with this activity in our live logs, we're not going to need it. Now we're going on to our next quarter close. So all user activity is going to move to our archive, and our live logs will have nothing older than 90 days. But our archive will still have those error messages and user activity. And that will live for just another, uh, another month until we get to 120 days, at which point we can say, you know what? Those error messages, if we haven't dealt with them now, we're just going to get rid of them. So we're going to purge them out of the archive, but we'll keep user activity because the SOX information may be something that you want to keep for a longer period of time. So this was one example how data can move through the system. And from this, you could see that the data volume in our system is going to remain relatively constant because it will be continuously filtered. And again, nothing older than 90 days lives in the live logs, and the archive will contain only really data between 30 days and 120 days, except for some key user activities. Okay. So some implementation details here is that it may be useful to coincide the rolling of a log with a stage um, and archive appropriately. So if you're going to roll the SBase log or planning logs every week, that's a good opportunity to archive those records, in which case if you've archived the records, you don't need to keep the rolled logs on hand. Take what you need out of them, um, zero out the production log, and you're good to go. The other thing is, and again, in this amount of time, we don't have time to go into a lot of details. When it comes to how you actually accomplish this, using pattern, ma pattern matching scripts like a, a technology called Python is really a simple way to get information out of a flat file into a database. Um, another thing is that flat file logs that get rolled, it may just be easiest to archive the relevant records rather than thinning them out. So you can run a script to thin out logs, but just archive and then delete may be the best approach. And then if you can, keep the archive database on a non-production instance so that it's not interfering with your core uh, production systems. 
Okay. So I'm going to do a very quick demo in Excel to us about how we can do all of this with just a couple of clicks. Again, the idea of today's presentation was to discuss best practices for managing logs for both performance as well as accessibility. Um, in the time that we have, we, we can't get into details of how to accomplish it. But what we do in the product is try to automate these processes. So very quickly, I'll show you that in Exceltis, in our automation module, we can create an archive and purge flow where we have four stages. And I'll just show a couple of the stages. So in Exceltis, we can come in and say our first stage, we're going to look at our S-based logs and our HFM logs. And we're going to archive anything that was an error or warning, like we just showed in that example. And we're going to purge anything that is an informational message. So, th so this will take care of that first stage of archiving errors and warnings, getting rid of informational messages. You can see we do it in just a couple of clicks. Then stage two is going to operate on our log archive. And what we're going to do is now we're just going to get rid of warning messages. So all we'll have in the archive are error messages. So again, we're thinning, we continue to thin it out. And then stage three, what we'll do is we will move user activity records to the archive, so archive user activities. And, um, and then that data will live on for 220 days. And then finally in stage four, what we'll do is we will delete user, or uh, we'll delete error messages and all we'll be left with are our user activities. And what this looks like is that if we go to activity analysis, this is the place where we can look at all of our log data. So we can very quickly access our S-based logs, our planning logs, or HFM logs. I'll do a very quick example of HFM archiving and purging that we did where, for example, if I want to get HFM task audit information and I want to get it for the last 30 days, I just pick my HFM log, I say I want it for 30 days, and what we see here on the screen is that I only have days for I only have data in my HFM task audit live log for the last few days, there's nothing before that. And that's because we archived and purged it. So our production HFM task audit log only will keep like 10 days worth of data. In this example, I did a 10 days, a 10 day cycle. Well, what I can do is I can just click on the Exceltis log archive and say, let's get data for the last 30 days. And what we see here is for the log archive, I have data that's older than 10 days going back in time. So I still have access to all of my HFM task audit data, but my production log only has 10 days, but those other records have been archived. And I can operate on these just as I would, uh, just as I would if it were a live log. We're using Celtis, we can come in and drill down into this activity, and we can keep going further and further. So I can look at this one activity that happened, this metadata load that happened um, on January 22nd and took eight seconds. So even though it's in our archive, we can still get at it. We still know exactly what happened in the system. But you can see that we keep our production logs trim while still maintaining access to our log archive. And again, we can do this whether it's HFM, S-based planning uh, reports or so on. So again, we're at our 20 minute, 21 minute limit. Hopefully this was helpful. Again, the purpose of this webinar was to discuss best practices for managing Oracle EPM logs and focusing on both performance as well as maintaining accessibility. And the idea is that you can put into place a manual process for um, archiving and purging your logs in multiple stages so that the more access you have to your logs, the more value they will, they will bring to you. Again, thank you for joining. If you'd like a copy of this uh, recorded video, please send a note to Ed, Ed Delisi. And if you do have any questions, we will uh, respond to you directly uh, with answers. Thank you again for joining.